I just introduce myself. I'm Steve Lawrence. I'm from the very bottom of New Zealand. Um, that, as you can see, is the game they play from heaven. Um, just to reiterate the fact that I'm sure you all know that Agile is very much a team sport. It is very much about the team rather than the individual. This team here, the team I support, usually this struggles at the bottom of the ladder almost every year. We hadn't won that trophy for um, 60 years. They pulled this team together and then they won it about three years ago, first time in 60 years, lost it straight away, as you'd expect. But they won it again two years, a year later again, and it's all based around the team. There's no All Blacks in that team, it's just all about the team ethic. So thank you to come along, come along to um, listen to this talk on metrics. So we'll start off by talking about some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of metrics. First off, we'll talk about the ugly. I've been travelling back and forward from Auckland to various parts of Australia since 2008. And the first thing that I've found in doing that is Australians have a fascination about sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so let's cover the sheep off first, shall we? But it's actually a very good model to actually start looking at metrics in a system rather than individual components. So within a sheep farm, it's very easy. You've got three basic products. You've got meat, wool, or selling stock. Then you've got some trends and some metrics that they, their farmers are very conscious of. One of them is the use that aren't producing lambs, your dry stock, and the other is your lambing percentage. This here is incidental, they can't control this, is what the price of the market's paying, but they can control this. It's very important that they monitor what their dry stock is, and if they increase the, their, their stock numbers, this is from my father's farm, increase the stock numbers, and see what happens to the, to the lambing percentage. So it's, it's all about you know increasing the stock, doesn't necessarily give you a greater return. You have less lambing percentage, less sales, and it costs you. You also have higher, higher dry stock. In this case here, looking at the system as a whole, looking at the trend analysis, we've got six to three percent of our system is unproductive. That's costing us ten thousand dollars a year. When we've got a high high input, low margin business, that's really important. So you increase your stock numbers, you put your ewes that are dry, you put them in dancing lessons, hairstylist, etc. Try and see what happens, and it goes down. So then you've got a choice, what do we do? We offload the unproductive units and bring in some more productive units. That's a good model to just look at the system rather than the individuals as a, as a whole. Um, just to set an expectation, I am from New Zealand, New Zealand, I do talk fast. You'll find that the first 15 minutes of this will just rattle through really, really quickly, and then it'll settle down. Um, and I've just spent four days in Sydney giving fundamental training courses back to back, so I've almost got no voice. So the most important thing to know about metrics, it all comes back to the dollar. It's all about economic decisions and using metrics to plan and be able to make reasonable decisions based on core, hard data. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Don Reinertsen. Anyone heard of Don Reinertsen? Principles of Product Development Flow. He's basically an economist, economist <coughs> who studied a lot of projects um, and he's come up with a lot of different formulas and theories for working out metrics to apply to the, to the project world. But basically, our overall goal is to influence our economic decisions, using core data to do that rather than emotional feeling. So the most important thing, this is what I want you to take away. You're going to see a lot of different options for metrics, but this is the key. Why, how, and who? Why do you want to capture them? How are you going to use them? <coughs> and who will actually use them? Who are you capturing them for? So that is the only thing that I want you to really take away. So why do we have metrics? We want to affirm and reinforce our lean and agile principles. We want to measure outcomes, not outputs, outcomes. We want to follow trends, not numbers. Trends tell us a story, numbers is just a point in time. <coughs> we want to provide fuel for meaningful conversation. We want to be able to support a decision making process. <coughs> This is a guy called Douglas W. Hubbard, and if you read that first sentence, it's very pertinent. If measurement happens at all, it is because we must have some conceivable effect on decision making and behaviour. Really, really important. If you're just capturing metrics for the sake of it, then why are you bothering? You're spending a lot of time gathering data for no real reason. <coughs> These guys were supplying the muffins for morning tea, is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> So what do you use them for? Support organisational objectives, as you'd expect. Optimise learning. They should be simple. If they're really hard, really complex, so we're going to get a lot of value out of them. If we keep them hidden away, we're going to get a lot of value out of them, so make them visible. 
They should be well understood and easily adopted. If they're not well understood, again, why are you bothering capturing them? But most importantly, again, they should guide our actions and our decisions. <coughs> Little cool. Bad ones. We've all seen bad metrics. Click because they always have been. Uh, just in these training sessions I've just been, I give them the story about the, the monkeys and the bananas. You heard that one? You know, not heard that one? It's basically what the PMO model is. Anyone from PMO world here? Sorry if I upset you. Um, basically, you put five monkeys in a room, banana up a ladder. Every time a monkey tries to climb the ladder, spray him with water. Next monkey comes up there, spray him with water. So then you've got two monkeys that don't climb the ladder because they know they're going to get sprayed with water. What happens when the third monkey climbs up? The two others jump on him. So don't do that, you're going to get sprayed with water. The next one comes up. So the whole five of them now learn don't climb the ladder because you're going to get jumped on or sprayed with water. Switch your monkey out. What's the first thing the new monkey does? He tries to climb the ladder. And what happens to him? The rest of them jump on him. Stop him doing it because he's going to get sprayed with water. Take out all the monkeys and bring in a new lot. Do any climb the ladder? No. Do they know why they're not climbing the ladder? No. And that's why we have a PMO. <laughs> so metrics encourage gaming of the system as well. We've got to be very careful of that. If you start chasing velocity, you're going to gain the system to hit it. If you set a target, you're going to gain the system to hit it. So metrics can result in bad behaviour, and they do ignore the system a lot if we, if we don't actually think about what we're trying to do. And they don't align with the why. These are all bad metrics. <coughs> metrics should align back to your strategic organisation objectives. So some common measures. What's the first one? Estimating. I had to put this in here on last night because after five days with um, these guys in Sydney, what do you think one guy said in the first time he saw this slide? <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's my wife. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how to deal with that and one of the ladies in the room says, and she looks very disappointed, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in there. But that's one of the most basic metrics we got is our estimation, right? But we're not very good at it. We've got to accept the fact we're very poor at estimating. So looking at some of these productivity metrics that are available out there in the world, and I'm sure you can Google all these and find them, um, one that I really, really don't like is that revenue per employee. I do not think we should be looking at that as a metric. We're making it down to the individual rather than the team. A couple of important ones. If you're in an operation type environment or a DevOps environment, SLA achievement metrics are really, really important because you're going to get penalised if you don't achieve your SLA contractual obligations. Velocity is another important one, but velocity is just a guide. It is not the be-in and be-all and end-all of productivity metrics. It's a guide that gives you predictability. <coughs> Talking too fast still? <coughs> cool. It is early in the morning and I've got to try and keep you awake and I haven't had my coffee fix yet. <laughs> Predictability, it's really, really important, especially in an agile world, because we want to be able to predict back to our sponsors and our stakeholders what we can do, how long it's going to take, and give them an understanding of what to set the budget levels at and when they can actually start looking at doing releases. Velocity variance is really important. If we have a lot of variance in our velocity, we lose a lot of our predictability. Feature comparison is another good one. Agile has moved in probably this, we'll call it the second wave now, where we're climbing out of individual team level agility, starting to look at the program level and the portfolio level agility. When we start feeding the beast, it's going to turn out the work. And so we need to have some mechanism of actually measuring you know, the difference in size between the various <coughs> features rather than going down to user stories, etc. So feature comparison is a very, very good metric and it gives you, again, predictability. Customer satisfaction, net promoter score training. Most of your organisations probably do that, do you? If your customers aren't happy with you, you're going to be in business next year. If it keeps going down to buy the trend, what does that tell you? Something's got to change. If it's going up, hey, we're doing something right. Um, there's a book by a guy called Jeffrey Moore called Escape Velocity. I think every senior manager or decision maker in an organisation should read that book, knowing when to pivot, climb out of the whirlpool going down and try something new. If the executives at Kodak had done that, IBM computers had done that, um, and a few of the others, the um, bookstores, the world changes pretty quickly and you've got to be able to change with it. So is your trend going down, static, and when do you need to move on and select a new product, a new initiative, or change radically? I think I heard Nokia used to be a forestry company. Now it makes mobile phones. That's a bit of a left field shift, right? 
Quality. Unit test coverage does not guarantee co uh, quality, but it's a start. Automated functional test coverage. I like that personally better because I'm a business type person. Um, issue reintroduction rate. There's a company I did some coaching for in Auckland. They're based, their whole head office and the development centre is in Wales. When I was coaching them, they had eight months worth of defects to fix. That's eight months of defect fixing. They had no automated testing, no continuous integration. That eight months is gone, and they've still got about another six months. It's one step forward, two back, one step forward, two back, and they have no measure of the quality at all. Automated functional test coverage, looking at it on the other hand, in New Zealand, they align all their releases <coughs> to the maintenance release. So the maintenance release comes out every month, every project has to align with that. They have two automated functional testers on the maintenance team and every project must have a full <coughs> suite of automated functional tests because if their booking engine goes down for a significant amount of time, they lose millions and millions of dollars very, very quickly. So it's very important that they focus on getting that automated functional test coverage up to a very, very high level and they maintain it. They're very religious about that. Employee satisfaction. We could all look like this guy, come to work, love our job, everything just works nicely for us. I worked for an insurance company in Auckland and they had the three buckets, the red bean, green bean and white bean. Red for I've had a really shit day, I really hated being here, I don't really want to come back. White beans, yeah, it was okay, and green, I'm loving this place. After the first week, they took away the red bucket. So they actually started to get some good results after that. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're a very, very toxic environment, unfortunately, and that toxicity comes from the top. It's how people interact. Again, it comes back to the behaviours. Their behaviours weren't aligned with an agile world, and it fed right through the organisation. Attrition rates is another important one. If you're losing a lot of people, that costs you a lot of money. It costs you a lot of time, and everybody else is impacted. When a skilled engineer, this is from about five years ago, the numbers, <coughs> when a skilled engineer walks out the door, you lose about $150,000. That's how much it costs to replace them. It's probably a lot more than that now. You've got to bring someone in, you've got to pay a recruitment company, you've got to spend a lot of time and effort trying to upskill and pump information into that person to give them the required level of information and knowledge to actually be a valued member of the team, and that also impacts the rest of the team around you as well, because you've also got to help with that process. So you lose a lot of productivity and a lot of time with that. So employee satisfaction is really important. I'm sure you'll work in really lovely environments, you love your job, great managers, can't wait to go back there after here, right? Responsiveness is another, another biggie. Cycle time for a story. How long does it take a story to cross your story wall? Where are your trends? Where are your blockers? Start looking at some of that information. Your queue batch size. Again, from Don Ronaldson, we'll cover this in a bit of it more. Having big long queues because big waste and big cost. Lean time to fix if you're in an operational in the area. How long does it take you to fix stuff? Even within the project world, you uncover defects. How long does it take you to get them fixed? Within? Is it in that iteration, the next iteration, within that release, or you just park it and hand it over to a DevOps area? There was a team in um, a certain bank based in Brisbane, which will remain nameless. They had a project which I dubbed Project Seagull. It was just going to come in and crack all over the operations team. <laughs> <laughs> we found that they were doing was every defect that they figured it was going to take more than three days to fix, they changed it to an enhancement. <laughs> so it went off their books onto someone else's. And in the end, the support team figured out they were doing this and they said, no, we just want you out of it. We want to take control of it so we can actually fix this up so we can actually deliver something that works. But again, it's using the metric to figure out what was going on. But metrics by themselves, it's just at a point in time, it's just a number. It doesn't tell you a story. This here is much more pertinent. This is Al Gore on this cherry picker over here looking at the impacts of global warming. If you look at that number by itself, probably doesn't tell you anything, right? It's just a really high number <coughs> there, okay, whatever. But when we look at the trend of what's happening, then bang, that tells us a really, really remarkable story. There is, I mean, in Melbourne, is there global warming? No. In Southland, is there global warming? No, it's bloody cold. But when you look at something like this, this tells a very powerful story. And I'm, I'm on, on the plane <coughs> Perth last week, and I watched a, a documentary by a guy called Jim Bailiff, Bailoff? called Chasing Ice. 
he's got all these cameras set up all over the world just photographing the glaciers retreating. And I think in 90 years, on average, the glaciers moved back 10, 10 miles over 90 years. In the last 10 years, they've gone back about 30 or 40. They are retreating at a massive, massive rate. It is really quite frightening. But the trend analysis tells us that, especially you can see when everything's just got <laughs> taken off backwards, and that's a very important point. Trends. Trends tell a story. Numbers are disappointing time. It's like you fighting for your political parties to Labour versus coalition. Is that what it is? Yeah. I mean, the, the numbers tell you nothing, but the trend will tell you a story. What are they doing? Going up, going down. <coughs> And this is the metrics that their <coughs> advisors all chase. So one of the metrics that I personally like is velocity, because it gives me what? Predictability. I can start looking into the future, have a very good idea how teams are going, when they, I can expect them to finish, what the impacts of change is that I might bring into their project. In this example here, this is from a real project, 450 story points in the backlog. We said they'd do 78, they did 68. Next iteration, they took that learning on board, said they do 70, they did 74, learning, 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 more data. Next one, they said they did 75, and they did 75, so somewhere around about here, we've got what we call sustainable pace. That gives us predictability. We can extrapolate those numbers up against their complete backlog, drop it down. We know how long it's going to take to deliver. We know our team size, we know what the cost of that team is, so we know our budget, right? It's not a thumb suck at the start when we're doing a business case. This is based on pure, hard, data that we can actually recognise and show people. If we have a change request comes in, like happened here, 20 story point change request, <coughs> just see what it does to the line. Drop it down, we need another half an iteration. It's going to cost us again half cost of that team, which is what, no, probably about 50k for, for this period. Is that change worth 50k? What are you going to drop out if their budget's set? Just core data that you can use really quickly and efficiently. How velocity works. This was from a team in a certain telecommunications vendor. <laughs> this will remain nameless. So velocity is a guide. It's yesterday's weather. It is not the be all and end all. So we've got to use it as a guide, but it is a very important guide. This team said, and this is what the project manager, who was committing the team to this work, a nice person. This iteration, we completed 90 story points. The next iteration, we'll do 160. At which point, I pulled him back and said, hang on, what did you do over the last three iterations? Well, over Christmas we did 45, the next one we did 60, and this one we did 90. So naturally you ask the question, well, what makes you think you can deliver 160? The simple answer, because we have to. <laughs> it's like, really? And an architect at the back of the room says, but history's showing you can't do that. Why are you trying to do that? Because we have to, and the team will do it. So I turned around to the team, can you do it? And they all shook their heads and said <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Being the nice person I was as a coach, I let them do it. They worked seven days a week for a four-week iteration, 10 hours a day. They came in absolutely shattered, but they did it. But could they do the next iteration? Was it sustainable? Were they all bored, burnt out? Were they enjoying themselves? Was the quality high? No, we needed all those other metrics to track the impact of what this project manager made them do. It was quite interesting. I think they learned a valuable lesson with that one. Um, so with velocity, you can have poor cadence. If we've got something like this, is that useful to us? No, it doesn't tell us a story, right? We're all over the show. Something remarkably wrong, either in our, our estimation process, our capacity management, or the type of work we're doing, we simply don't understand enough. If there's something wrong here, so that tells us a story. We've got some trends that we think something's not right with what we're doing. <coughs> if we have something like that, what does that tell us? Pretty good, we've got a lot more predictability, very good cadence. If we have a flat line, what does that tell us? Someone's gaming the system. Someone's figured out how to make this work. We'll set a target, 19 story points. We're going to do 19 story points. Well, when we actually scale up a level, we start looking at the second wave of agile. We want to start planning at a program level. Then it's very important we start looking at what our teams are doing. So team A here, in this case, 23 points per sprint. Pretty good. Team B has got a different process for doing their estimation, 235 points per sprint. Same time period, same work, but do you have the predictability? No, you can't. It's still all over the show. So you need to normalise, and this gets a little bit contentious, and I know you guys have been doing it very well. Um, Bankwest do it very, very well. They've basically made a simple rule, one story point equals one ideal day. How long is an ideal day? I don't know, it might be four hours, six hours, eight hours, I might work nine hours a day, 
an ideal day, but it's a guide, it's a yardstick, right? And every team uses that to estimate their work. Bankwest have actually taken away um, a one-point story card, unpack it, understand all the tasks, what's this behind it, put it on a wall. They did the same with a three and a five. <coughs> so they've unpacked them all, so once the team sit down, they do their commitment to what they're going to achieve, then they take those cards back and just make sure it's still relevant against what the, the comparators are. Very simple, very effective, but normalising gives you a yardstick to let start predicting at a program level. And I've been doing this since 2008, so I know it actually works. So here's the Telstra EDW program. Do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, that's my program. Uh, which one of these teams are gaming the system? It's not so much gaming, it's a dream <laughs> line. And that one there, that's the interesting point. I actually know what happened there. And look, these guys are all working on a very similar standard program of work for building an enterprise data warehouse. The work is the, pretty much the same, but again, as Steve was pointing out, they were all doing things completely differently at the start. And these guys had a fantastic outlier here. Can we get that over there? Easter? No, not quite. They developed a fantastic new pattern, a new way of working, which caused an immense spike in the velocity, which went rolled out across the teams, which caused other teams to start uplifting as they adopted that um, improvement, which is really cool. That was Easter. That was just a bad iteration, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at this, you've got some trends there, right? What, if you're seeing all that much of red. What's the color code? Sorry? What's the color code on the graphs? Like oh, the color code. Green, green. Work, work in progress, work accepted. Okay. The red's accepted. Yeah. And that first question, if you're looking at these trends, what's the question you're going to ask? Why is there so much red? What do we need to do to change our process to try and make it so our work is accepted? It's pretty much like that one there was almost perfection, right? How do we get, no, yeah, no red. So again, it's a trend, but it tells a story in the same time. You can actually follow the trend line, so you can actually look at their velocity. This is a computer generated one, so whether it's accurate or not, leaves a lot to be desired, but you can actually see the predictability, all things being equal, if the work doesn't change, the team makeup doesn't change, then we can actually predict out into the future what we're going to do, what we can achieve. But that's from the EDW program. So let's look at some of the examples of badness out there in the world. And I'll have seen these comments. I want the blue team to work on my projects because their velocity is higher. Poor old blue team, got a lot of work. What's happened to the red team? No, we've got nothing to do. We're going to sit here, we're going to read the paper, Google. I want to compare the output of the people in the team. That's a goodie. I saw this one in um, that same place in Brisbane, which was a very cool bank. Read that statement. We committed to 120 story points and completed them all and carried through 30. <laughs> what does that actually say? What have they just set themselves up to do? What is this stakeholder's expectation? You've done 120 story points last time. My expectation is you're going to do 120 again, right? So you told me you completed them all. How many did they actually complete? So they've gone to 120 again, but they've still got 30 in their pockets, so they're now looking at 150. And they're going to have the same thing, we completed 150 and we carried forward 90. <laughs> so it was a recipe for disaster, but they were just trying to snowball their customer, who swallowed it all up. As a manager, I have to constantly drive my teams to ensure that they meet the goals we set. Again, command and control management, let's set a goal, and what the goal that the team has is my goal, the <coughs> 160 story points. <coughs> so be very aware of the examples of badness and use metrics to try and overcome that. So metrics are your friend. That's not one to do. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a company that I was working for had no idea what to do or how to performance manage people in an agile team. So they started um, saying, send us your burn down charts. So this poor guy had to collect all of the burn downs for the team over the course of the year, take them to his yearly performance review and explain all the trends and basically pointing out well, you didn't have a particularly good burn down there, what happened? Just taking into account none of the variations of work, it was just looking at whether you hit your target. Yep, and I've seen that in the company that you work. The directors have a meeting, they go through every project, anything that's over budget, let's discuss, even if it's $2. The amount of time, effort, and just pure waste is astronomical. Use metrics, they are your friend. You've all seen burn down charts. Which are the goodies and which are the baddies? What do the ones down the bottom tell us? Not much. <laughs> 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 Nothing to see here. 
A burn down chart is an information radiator. It is an early warning sign, early warning system. I have seen these. It scares me. They just cr cruise along and crash. Why are you wasting time and effort on creating something like that? This one here tells another different story. We've learned how to game the system. <laughs> this one here, I think they just went, gave up and went home. <laughs> <laughs> but these ones here give us something that we can action, action, actually action. We're going up here. What does that mean? Something's changed. Either we've underestimated everything, um, <coughs> the scope creep in here, or something we simply don't know. At, what, at this point here, maybe we're having a discussion with our product owner. We don't think we're going to achieve. We're flatlining. We need to take something out. Or we might have a blockage here. We can't get time with the subject matter experts we need to talk to. Or X, Y, Z. It's an early warning sign that you can actually start working with. <coughs> if you're tracking something like that, probably pretty cool. You're quite comfortable with how the team is progressing. This one here, maybe having a different conversation. We're going to blow this away and finish really early. We need to bring some more scope into our backlog to keep the team busy. It's an early warning system. Does that make sense? So I'll, go, I'll actually go back to this and I'll be contentious because I love this. How do, what do you think the metrics are here for measuring the yeah, burn down? I can tell you exactly what it was. It was story points. If you've got big, chunky story points, how do you estimate time remaining to complete? Which is what a burn is about, right? You can't do anything with burnt time. We're looking with time remaining to complete. How many story points left to complete? You've got an eight story point card, how many story points you've got to go? Who the hell knows? This is why within Scrum, and there's a lot of issues and the contentions around it, we use hours on the left scale. But we don't use hours for commitment. We use it purely for tracking time remaining to complete. You commit to the work, but track on hours. But if you've got user stories that are half, one, two, or three, maybe even five, you probably don't need to bother. If they're small enough, they should flow through. Does that make sense? It's a little bit contentious. A lot of people don't like ours, and a lot of people do. I'm one of the ones that do. And if you find that people say there's a lot of badness out there, project managers jump on it. So you see it's going to take you 10 hours, it's taking you 14. What's the problem? The problem is with you because your cultural alignment is not with that job. So you manage flow, watch your work in progress, seeing if you can cut that down, especially. Um, in an operational context, you've got a high transactional volume of work going through a board. Stop starting, start finishing. Um, husbands in the room, people who have partners who control their workload in the weekend. <laughs> this is a very good tool. <laughs> Stops a lot of arguments, or starts a lot. Usually in startup experiments. So have an idea, do something really quick and simple. Measure it, capture that data. Is it worth carrying on with this idea? Seek did this with a, um, they wanted a new field on one of their web pages. There was a lot of discussion whether it would add value. So what did they do? Let's put the field on there, see if people will actually fill it in. And then if they fill it in, we know it's got value. They didn't put any code or anything in behind. It was just a field there and they measured whether people actually filled in the field. How costly was that? But they got real core hard data. They said, yeah, people are actually, everybody's filling it in. We can use this. Back done. But being able to pivot and learn very, very quickly without actually having large amounts of work to undo or redo. Very simple, very cost effective, and it's a learning point. <coughs> I'm sure you've all read Lean Startup by Eric Ries, right? Well, then we go into second wave. Um, and I'm Is Mark talking about this today? I don't think so. Uh, David Smyers, if you know. David Smyers, David Smyers. Yeah. So, Scale Nature Framework, this is what I'm seeing predominantly across, especially the Australian landscape now, is we have a project vision. We're seeing half billion dollar programs of work that are sitting there. We know what we're going to do. We've got a project vision. And we've got all these teams spinning away and doing work. <coughs> but there's no mid-range plan in here. There's no release plan, no program level plan. It's just teams doing stuff. If you look at some of the metrics from that, what are they actually doing? They're doing work, so we're going to see that in terms of the team level metrics, it's very good. But in terms of delivering output and outcomes to the organization from a program level, they're not. It's all, there's no, nothing to back it up. We're just doing work. It's like picking up a, a big requirements document and starting at the top and working your way through. 
same at the portfolio level. So this is where we need to start changing the dynamic, thinking about how we feed the beast and how we actually start making these strategic decisions up top. Anyone not seen the Scaled Agile Framework before? If you go to this website, www.scaledagileframework.com, this is a very interactive web page. You click on any single one of these icons and you get a two-page narrative describing what it is afterwards. So if we start looking at a program level, we're going to start looking at different means of doing a prioritization and using metrics to inform our decisions. Remember, metrics are about informing decisions. So we're using weighted shortest job first. So user value plus time value plus risk reduction or opportunity enablement over our job size. Very simple way of doing it. It takes away the argument of who shouts the loudest, gets their work done. Here's an example for me when I actually did the course with Mark, doing a Scaled Agilist course. So I had a presentation I needed to do. This was this one for Agile Australia. I had to complete a sales proposal, and I had to do some remote training feedback to the team in Singapore. Which one was I most emotionally engaged with and stressing the most about? Putting together this presentation, because it was a lot of work to do and a lot of investigation. But when I went through this example, it started to become clear where I should have been spending my time. So user business value, nothing to the company, pretty much, well, there's a little bit of brand, but it was more about me being nervous. Time criticality, the sales proposal had a deadline that we had to get out. Risk reduction, opportunity enablement, of course the sales thing is always going to be higher there. So a cost of delay, which Don Ronson says is our single biggest metric we should start capturing. And divide that by the job size. What does that tell you? What should I have been spending my time on? Sales proposal, followed by remote feedback, and then the presentation. Where was I spending my time? So I had to do a change pretty quickly. But it's very simple, and it is a core metric to inform decision making. It takes the decision making away from, you need to do my work. Somebody shouts really loudly and they're a high powered person in the organisation, versus someone here has got a really valuable, critical piece of um, project work that's going to increase the revenue, avoid costs, whatever within the organisation. This helps, and it's so simple. It's just a really simple formula. And I'll leave you right now because I see you writing it. If you go into um, the scaledagileframework.com, it's actually got this formula in there. Um, we'll look up some of Diane Ronaldson's work. So this is from Diane Ronaldson. In our experience, no single sensitivity is more eye-opening than the cost of delay. And it's really, really important. There's a couple of examples here. I'll, I'll share one with you. Um, we were doing some work with a UK company. Um, we were running what's called a wrap session, rapid planning session. I think I'm giving a discussion about the open, some open session later on today on that. We sat there, we had a rep session running, we had the senior executive from this company in this room for two days. We were arguing for those two days between the, the um, marketing manager and the finance manager. As the vendor, we were saying we need 250,000 pounds to complete the scope that the marketing manager is saying to do. The finance manager is saying no, the budget said that's all you're getting. For two days they were arguing about that. We said well we can actually take people off it, we'll delay the time to deliver it. That's their only way forward for us because we can't invest so many people on this, it's a losing game for us. So they kept on arguing for two days, and in the end we went away and got the CEO out. And the CEO came and says, well, let me be very clear to you. As soon as this project gets, goes live, I make three million pounds a month. Do I care about 250K? Take it off the table, get it done, get it live, give me my ROI. And what we were planning to do was we were going to push that right out. So this cost of delay would have been huge. That 250K would have been about nine million pounds. Cost of delay is a really important aspect. <coughs> Again, it's a metric that informs decision making. Any project managers in the room that used to do this or in value analysis? I think it was quite cool, eh? Doing all these real cool mathematical formulas in the world all look really cool. Personally, I don't do it, but I know you can. You can do Agile EVM. Um, the I think it's the earned value is pretty much similar to you burned out. But if someone insists on you doing that, you can actually Google this and find all the information, but personally, I wouldn't go near it. So let's look at capacity planning as a metric. I'm sure you'll do capacity planning. Yep, you've all seen the motorway things. You've got that red light you have to stop and you've got to wait for a green before you can carry on on the motorway. But when you start looking at that and the, the utilisation times, Oh, this is separate actually. We'll come on this. 
So waiting times double when you go from 80 to 90 percent. And what do we see in a business? What are we trying to get our people to chase in terms of the utilisation target? 100. 100 or 110. We want to work really hard. But the waste doubles from 80 to 90 percent, and it doubles again from 90 to 95. So if we're chasing 100, what are we just done to our people? We've thrown about 40 to 50 percent waste in there. Really important. And I mean, a typical working day for an average person is what? We're there for eight hours, but what's our, what's our actual Six. output? Six. Six is probably really, really good. I mean, we're, in a, we're in a culture now that is defined around meetings. Meeting this, meeting that, meeting this, meeting that, and it's just waste. So we have these cues, and this is where a lot of this waste comes from. <coughs> we're waiting on subject matter expert opinion. We're waiting on sign-offs. Management have got to review what we're doing. We've got a big upfront analysis. We know we have to do that. We're going to wait on releases. And what is the impact of that? We've got lower cycle times, <coughs> bigger risk, more bullet variability. And if you have big batch sizes, like you're in a, in a large organization, probably they have this big couple of times a year, they have this big release. What have we just done? Significantly up the risk, significantly up the cycle time, significantly lower the opportunity to gain some ROI. It's a recipe for disaster. So what Don says, there's more value created with the overall alignment rather than local excellence. And I'll show you what this looks like. So this is where I used to live before I had a brain explosion and moved to Melbourne. <laughs> I used to live here. It used to take me 15 minutes, rush hour, to get into town. Off peak it was seven minutes. Pretty close, right? But the Auckland City Council, in their wisdom, they've watched the rest of the world, they put in all these traffic lights around the place that monitor the the flow of traffic onto the motorway. So they put traffic lights here. But they didn't think that, okay, there's already a traffic light here, there's already a traffic light here, there's already a traffic light there. So all the feeder roads were already controlled. So they put that there, that gave them some local excellence. And they impacted that area. My drive into the city went from 15 minutes to 40. All these roads here were completely clogged. This one here was, there's another traffic light here, that was backed up right to here. So all these little feeder roads couldn't get onto any of these major roads, which is gridlocked. But that's not looking at the, you know, looking at the local excellence rather than the big impact. Being the council, they'll probably pick this up right and figuring out how to fix it. <laughs> no way. They, they just concentrate on that bit. So understanding the impact of what you're actually trying to achieve from a wider area rather than just your little individual element. So we're just going to have a look at the seven deadly sins of agile measurement. Don't use metrics as levers. They're not a stick to beat someone over the head. Okay? They are a metric which you can facilitate a conversation or you can give feedback. Don't use a metric just because it's convenient. Before it's captured this metric, let's carry on doing it. Again, it comes back to the story of the monkeys, right? What are you trying to do? What decision are you trying to make? What behaviours are you trying to change? Using bad analysis. I mean, if you look at half of the polls that you get from um, when you're coming up to election, there's probably a lot of bad analysis. They twist the door to try and get it to show that they're doing really well, to try and <coughs> change things. Motivating people to hide information. That does happen, unfortunately, because we've all got KPIs we need to achieve. We've got our professional responsibilities or professional, what would you call it? I want to look good anyway. Mm -hmm. um, measures that are too costly together. Why are you doing it? What are you going to gain from doing that? Again, having too many metrics, you're just confusing the whole decision you're trying to inform. With too few metrics, it's like we've got nothing to base this on. If you had to look at, remember that the Al Gore of the cherry picker, we had a couple of data points along the bottom there, does that tell us the story? <laughs> but if you've got all those years of data, there's a real powerful message there. So we're trying to influence decisions and change or influence, facilitate discussions to change behaviours. Coming back to the key point, why, how, and who. When you start looking at metrics, always put this at the forefront. Why, how, and who. Why do we want to capture them? What are we going to do with this information? Who's going to use it? How is it going to be used? Really, really important. Those are the three fundamental questions I personally believe you should be asking. And that's me on time. And yeah, beautifully done. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Probably got a couple of questions.
Yeah. Based on that why concept of yours, where you said why do you want to specify that domain? Could it could it be something along the lines of what? So for example, we have some decision to get what could be why, what, what is the decision that you're trying to inform, the economic decision that you're trying to change? What are you going to use it for? Why are you capturing it? Yeah. So my question is, okay, we need some sort of decision around some area. What metrics do we need to capture for the things? Are there any guidelines on picking the type of metrics? If it's a productivity question or predictability question or a quality question, that'll start informing the type of metrics you're going to look at. Um, I'm not sure the environment you're in, but have a look at the various options that are available and what are the decisions, what, what behaviours or what economic decisions are you trying to influence? Um, if it's a productivity one, pretty simple. Um, predictability, you start to do planning, pretty simple. Quality, it's pretty simple. Um, there's a whole different way of metrics out there that can see you. But again, it comes back to what are you trying to do with it and how is it going to be used? Any other questions? Oh, would you recommend like incrementally building a set of metrics for a team, or do you think a big slab so you've got lots of things to look at? No, come back small good, okay. start simple. Yeah, yeah. And if those metrics aren't gathering the data that you want to gather to, to inform your decisions, change it. Don't keep doing bad metrics, change it up to a good metric. I think we're out of time. So thank you very much everybody. I hope that was valuable to you. Um, some of my information there, if you want to gather more information, have a chat to me and I'll be around the rest of the day.